Hello and welcome to the Ag Culture Podcast, where we cultivate tomorrow by inspiring agripreneurs and ag innovators through real life perspectives in agriculture. I'm Paul Windemuller, your host on this journey of exploration and growth. On today's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Hamish Gao, who is professor and chair of global supply chain at Lincoln University in Christchurch, New Zealand. I had the privilege to meet Hamish when I was in college almost 20 years ago now, and he is somebody that I've had a lot of respect for who's opened some doors for me along my career and probably the most well-connected person in agriculture that I know. But today, we're going to dive into this topic of value chains and value chain creation. Hamish has a way of putting very complex ideas into easy to understand perspectives. And I think you will really enjoy this conversation that I had with him and find it very insightful. So here's the interview with Hamish Gao. Hamish Gao, welcome to the Ag Culture Podcast. It is so good to have you here today. I am looking forward to our conversation. Uh, as always, we've had uh, many beers at the pub together over the years and uh, had a lot of great conversations in those times. Um, you are the Sir Graham Harrison Chair in Global Value Chains and Trade at Lincoln University in Lincoln, New Zealand. Is that correct? I am. I said it right? <laughs> It's absolutely correct. It's great to be on the podcast with you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, you are a value chain expert in agriculture and have a world, literally a world of experience. You're probably the most well-traveled person that I know. Um, two, two quick comments that I want to give to our audience. So number one, you, I think you are the most well-connected person that I know in all of agriculture. Everywhere I go, no matter what conference in agriculture I go to, I meet somebody that knows you. And uh, there's always a, that connection. We always all know Hamish Gao. So that's, that's one. And the second one is you have the most entrepreneurial spirit of anyone that I've ever met in academia. And um, I know you're following in the footsteps of your father, who was in academia. But uh, just to give a quick story for our audience, how we met, you were uh, a guest lecturer in one of my classes at Michigan State University when I was going there for agribusiness. And you were talking about value chains in that class and had mentioned that uh, you were um, at Lincoln University in New Zealand, that you came from there, and um, that I, I wanted to go to New Zealand and, and study, study there. And there was no study abroad program at that time at Michigan State. And usually they take two to three years is what I was told to get started. And you helped me uh, to create one in three months. And that very next semester after we met, I was in New Zealand at Lincoln University studying dairy production. So absolutely, that was that was incredible. And that was that was how we met. And um, I just want you to go into a little bit on what you're doing today. And also, I mean, you have a, a wealth of experience. Let's let's delve a little bit more into that as well and how that's shaped what you're doing today. Ah, uh, well, that's a good question, right? So it, it sort of started, right, way back when I was a student at Lincoln and I went on exchange to the U.S., just like you came on exchange to New Zealand. Um, and on my second day in the U.S., I met a farmer by the name of John Atkins. This is back in 1990 uh, in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And I was walking up the driveway to the house that I was staying at. And he was doing a startup called Atkins Ranch, uh, which is a meat company selling chilled lamb into the west coast of the U.S., primarily Whole Foods, but a whole lot of other ones. Uh, and so this is 35, 34 years ago. Um, that gives you sort of my age. Um, but he offered me a job, and he was driving around a white Ford 150 pickup truck with a big, huge cooler on the back of it, selling and trying to market chilled lamb into the west coast of the U.S., and particularly the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and he asked me, what do I know about the meat industry? I said, oh, I love the meat industry. I'm really interested in learning about it. He says, 
well, how about you come and work with me tomorrow? And so I ended up having an internship working for him for the next month or so, a couple of months over the summer, um, selling, helping him sell market lamb into the West Coast and learned so much about it because that was in that transformation point where up until then we were selling frozen carcasses and 90-something percent of all the meat going out of New Zealand was in a frozen carcass. And suddenly he was trying to sell chilled lamb um, into the supermarkets. And I learned so much about marketing and innovation and working in startups. But no one talked about working in a startup in 1990, right? That wasn't, we hadn't even had the tech boom in 1990, right? We didn't even have Windows. Um, and so here I was, found myself at that age, working with a startup, learning all about uh, what you needed to do, um, all the hard slog, all the long hours, uh, and really learning from first principles. And then I'm just sort of carried that on, right? And suddenly realizing that you can actually do things differently. Farmers need to think differently. It's not about what the market, and the big thing is, if you're really gonna innovate and you're gonna really do things differently in a value chain, you actually have to go all the way to the consumer. And, to the, and, and the consumer is not the retailer. It's not the supermarket, it's the consumer, right? And then understand the what the consumer wants. It. And then understand what the retailer who's selling it to them, which is not the big box store, it's actually the meat counter and what the person behind the meat counter needs to understand to be able to sell it. And you've got to work your way back and understand all those different incentives and then build a, a channel from that consumer all the way back to you as a farm. And that's really, really hard to do. And I've basically spent my career, um, firstly there, went to graduate school, um, went into Eastern Europe when the wall fell down and basically helped um, companies and farmers create new value chains in Central Europe. Uh, I've worked from the policy side with the Commission and OECD and others doing that. US faculty member doing that at Illinois, Michigan State, ran Pifford around the world when we met and then came back to New Zealand uh, to Massey, but then got seconded to the World Bank looking at food safety to try and think about what we did there. I was at Meat and Livestock Australia and the Australian food industry for a number of years running a food innovators program and then recently moved back to Lincoln. And at Lincoln, uh, I teach uh, food innovate. I teach an innovation class, entrepreneurship class for um, students to start businesses in the food and egg space, both selling technology into the farm as well as uh, stuff off the farm. Uh and then I run a dairy markets and prices pr course, uh, which is sort of part of my other life, um, is helping them farm dairy farmers really understand what the implications are of the revenue side of their profit and loss mm -hmm. and really understanding actually how markets operate and how that affects their business and the revenue side. Because farmers, dairy farmers in particular, just don't understand the cost side of the business. They really don't understand the revenue side of the business. And so we're doing a lot of work at the moment trying to help them understand that and understand the risks of that and then how they may want to do innovation and the way that they protect themselves against those risks. Yeah, and that's that's a point that I want to come back to. So don't let me forget about that um, on the, yep. the second second topic we have for today's discussion. But I, I really want to talk to today about uh, on the first portion of the episode the age old question of, of how do I capture more value for my product as a farmer, right? That's, that has been around. I mean, farmers were talking about it for the last 150 years. How do I capture more value off my farm on the product that I'm selling? And that's really what your career has involved looking at what, what you've done. So, uh, break that down a little bit for us. Uh, I, I know you were talking a little bit about that in your, your bio there, but just break that down a little bit more for us. Yeah, so all farmers, I, I'm working with a colleague of mine who was a past PhD student, uh, Eric Michaels at University of Saskatchewan, and the two of us have been driving a whole lot of work in value chains for the last, I don't know, um, seems like forever. Um, <laughs> but effectively, we look at value chains in three different ways. We look at it from a, a commodity-led Value chain, uh, which you just farm it, which is the standard one, right? It's got operational excellence. It's all about efficiency. The mark, the price gets set in adversarial markets between every link of the chain. You have no idea who the consumer is. Uh, what the markets do is they try to create a whole set of standardized norms 
and the way that you make money is being more efficient than your competitor um, and whatever you're producing and you produce to that standard um, and away you go. And that's how most agricultural production still gets sold around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people go, oh, there's premiums on this or premiums on that. Well, there might be premiums really quickly for a short period of time, but generally there's discounts if you don't meet those standards, right? Um, and so we've actually got the narrative wrong as we start looking at this stuff as sort of those really discounts, like you've got to meet the standard and then you want to optimize to meet that standard. Um, and there's not very premiums above the standard. You don't want to deliver above it. You want to deliver to it. But there's definitely discounts if you don't meet those standards. And so we often get the narrative wrong, right? So as we start moving and these standards change, and they do change, Mm -hmm. there's not premiums for it. There's just discounts if you don't, right? Which is just like um, when cars, when we had cars, we used to not have auto lock braking systems and airbags. So you used to get a premium for the first people who played played those out, but then very quickly they got commoditized and became standard. Um, And then there's hard, hard discounts if you don't have them. And so this is what happens in commodity markets all the time where farmers are sitting there assuming there's going to be a premium for that. There's not, right? It's just the standards keep on shifting up, and that's just part of the change in technology and innovation that's coming on. And the the market will institutionalize those in, and you have to respond to them. So you want it, the early leaders get cost advantages because they work it out. The late ones suddenly have these – it suddenly comes in, and you go, oh, as you have to take a breath and make that big step in with that new technology which comes. So an operational – excellent sort of commodity-led value chain um, is all based on standardized norms. Um, It's a competitive market. You can sell to anyone because you're running the same. So Chicago bought a trade with number two yellow corn or number two uh, yellow soybeans. Uh, You look at that with pork bellies um, or beef. And so dairy futures we've got um, with the GDT, we've got five reference product groups. So all of these are commodity markets which have got standardized norms and that's how they operate and they'll create innovations will get brought into them and be lifted up once it gets to a certain size and the whole market demands it and then it'll get normalized in and away you go um and every farmer gets that and there's the market's designed to make sure there's no excess premiums there's a standard or a norm that everyone meets um and if you don't meet it, you get penalized, or you don't even play the game anymore, right? Or you don't play the, or you don't play the game. You don't get access, right? Yeah. So that's the other thing is if you don't do it, you you lose, right, and you'll get kicked out of it, right? Because and the thing is, in a global market, it used to be that in a domestic market we could just play domestically and we could put political pressure on governments, etc., to say we're going to control this. Today. Markets are global, right? Everyone can see it. You can trade it. You can go and find it. If you don't produce it here, if the market sits here and says, this is what I want, the farmers here don't want to do it, they'll go somewhere else in the world and get farmers there to go and do it. And so all of those costs and to be able to trade in that market are decreasing so quickly that you can go and produce anywhere in the world as long as you can deal with the um all of the non-tariff trade barriers and any tariffs that get put onto it, um, you can go and procure a product from anywhere in the world. Now, we haven't got to the stage where we've got it perfectly and it's starting to break down at some level because of the WTO and we don't have um, enough judges uh, on the disputes panel within the WTO. So the rules-based system's in a bit of strife at the moment, but we'll leave that aside. That's the commodity channel. Um, and it's super efficient, and it's done a really good job to consumers around the world by decreasing the cost of food for all consumers and driving efficiency um, and creating disposable income for consumers. And so we've fed a lot of people, and we've got rid of a whole lot of uh, food shortages around the world because we had this really efficient commodity system, and it's created a shitload of wealth um, for uh, farmers everywhere around the world. There's two other different ways that you can create value in a um, two different other big models that we see out there and the way you can create value. One is a product-led value chain uh, or a product leadership um, type model. And that's where you own the IP to a specific type of product and that you're marking it and you position yourself at the top 
as a unique product. And the, the best example in this space is Zespri, which is with kiwi fruit, where they've created, um, they sell three types of kiwi fruit: a green kiwi fruit, a gold kiwi fruit, and a red kiwi fruit. Their gold kiwi fruit is unbelievable. Um, it is the best gold kiwi fruit anywhere in the world. They brand to it. They own all the IP uh, behind it. They have a fully integrated value chain uh, that they control and ensure that they get the perfect kiwi fruit to the market in every single market all around the world. Uh, and farmers have to pay to get a license to operate. And so uh, farmers have been paying up to a half a million dollars just for the license to grow a hectare of kiwi, gold kiwi fruit. Wow. Um, so you have to pay to play. Um, so it's a closed value chain all around that closed IP. Um, Zespri is a private company owned by the growers and the pack houses. They own the IP for the plant varieties. They um, sell that to the growers and then they sell a license to the growers to be able to come in and play. Um, and the growers make good money and really good returns by playing in that closed channel. And But the key piece is they have to deliver the perfect product every single time to a consumer when that piece of fruit sits on the bench, whether it's in Japan, Korea, uh, Europe, North America, it doesn't matter. Every time you pick up a Zespri kiwi fruit, it's absolutely perfect, exquisite every single time, eats the same way, um, lasts the same way, no problem. How would, what's the mechanism for that value flowing back to the farmers in that example? So the value gets within that channel. Uh, so Zespri is out there pushing it to be the top end. So that's like a top end clothing company, right? They're pushing it and saying, we've got the best. So very, very strict controls on farm or on orchard. So you can't harvest until you, you're let, let to harvest it. And then it goes to key markets. So the farmers uh, or growers, they'll provide their kiwi fruit to the pack house, which will pack it, and then it goes to shifts to ownership of Zespri. Zespri will then market that around the world within their channels and through their partners into all the key supermarkets. There'll be a return that comes back from them. Some of them are early because they'll sell quickly, other ones over the whole life of the kiwi fruit. That money all comes back into a pool. Um, that then Zespri takes out all of their marketing costs and distribution costs out of it. And then what's left in that pool will then get allocated to the pack house and to the growers, um, which comes back at an orchard gate return per tray um, that they'll get paid. And they'll get paid a percentage in advance. Mm -hmm. And then they'll get percent a percentage to close out at the end of the season. Uh, when they do the clean out of it all, right? So they pay them in advance for keeping cash flows running and then they um, do a final payment of it. And the growers, because they own the company um, and their single desk, which they trade through, make sure that they hold their company's feet to the fire and ensure that they're delivering them an appropriate return to it. And they've got growers on the board um, so it operates sort of like a cooperative, but it's not a cooperative. Um, but it's really designed, owned by the farmers, for the farmers to be able to deliver their return. But it's all based on a IP-based superior piece of IP which or intellectual property, which is the plant variety, which has got better um, eating rights. So they've got a big uh, plant breeding program, which they do in um, collaboration. They've got the Kiwi Fruit Breeding Center, which is a joint venture between Zespri and Plant and Food Research, which is a New Zealand Crown Research Institute. And they've been breeding kiwi fruit for a long time. Um, and it takes, I don't know, 15 to 20 years to get a new kiwi fruit from identification of that trait through the commercialization for it to come out the other end in a commercial version, which they can potentially um, bring to market. And so there's a lot of failures to be able to then create a new um, sun gold kiwi fruit, which comes out 
um, which is suddenly a winner. And remember, it's got a plant variety. It's got a life of that IP. So they've got to build the brand around it because at some stage, the IP protection will disappear. And so it's not just about the IP, it's about the whole system as well. Yeah. And, and so that's about this product leadership where you go and create this really amazing product to deliver into it. Um, but you've got to be able to market it and, and sell it um, and recognize it so you can brand it to be able to keep ownership of it. Mm-hmm. And then what we see is we see a, a customer lead or a customer intimacy type approach where um, you're really creating, you're trying to understand who your customer's problem is, which they're facing and how you go and solve their problem or their challenges. And so we've got a range of uh, companies that are moving into a lot more of a customer intimacy role. Uh, we've got the New Zealand Merino company with what they're doing with, with, with their brand partners. Uh, First Light Foods is a really interesting one. They sell grass-fed organic Wagyu. Um, the grass-fed Wagyu into, not organic, grass-fed Wagyu into uh, North America. And they've got a billionaires club where they're delivering them the perfect steak every month um and they go and sell and deliver them absolutely this perfect grass-fed um steak to their um weekend warriors which are these wealthy males and which are really highly marbled and then they have a equivalent one which they sell um to the wives who don't want one which is so highly (laughs) marbled um and so, which is the sales through all the rest of the, the week. But they've got a model which is very much aligned to solving the specific problem for a specific customer and then designing a model that delivers to that specific customer to solve their problem. And then this group and then this group, and they know exactly who their customer is, what they need, and then what's the most effective distribution channel to be able to get to that customer. Um and those types of channels work really, really well. But once again, you've got to be really, really close to the customer um, and what do they want, which is a challenge when you live in New Zealand because our customers are in 180-plus countries of the world and they're not in New Zealand. Right. And so we've got a challenge compared to everyone else in the world. In the US, your customers, your main customers just down the road. When I lived in, in Champaign, it was Chicago. When I lived in Michigan... It was Detroit and Chicago. Um, yep. So you knew who your customer was. It was easy to go and get to them and understand them. We didn't do it but because we didn't know. As farmers, we knew how to farm, and we're used to selling through a commodity market and a commodity-led channel, and now we're going to flip across to it. And you need to have a whole different way of doing it. Because once you go customer-led, you're going to really understand your customer and build your channel from the customer back, which is what we did with Atkins Ranch and Lean Meats. If you think about it from a product-led one with Zespra, you've still got to own that customer, but what you're doing is you're buying into a channel. But now you've got to align yourself to one company and one way of delivering it, one set of IP and one set of rules which you go and drive it and be right in behind it and put up a whole lot of capital to be able to get them behind it. And that's a mindset change, right? So if you're a commodity producer and all I do is worry about cost and efficiency, and I don't want to listen to the market. I don't want to be told what to go and do, but I want to create greater value. Uh, well, you won't be able to create it if you're in a commodity world, create greater value by becoming more efficient, right? And increasing productivity and getting often scale of size and economy. If you want to go the other way and there's this jump in mindset, you've either got to go and invest in a product led value chain, which means it's got IP behind it and there's a channel captain that you've got to go and follow. Or you've got to go into this customer intimacy one, right? But that means you've got to go and really understand who the customer is and really build that channel from that specific customer and what they want back. And they're two, they're very different mindsets. Yeah. And so when we start looking at these channels, investors like the IP one, because they can see locked in, you can get behind it, you can see what the return is. The traditional farmer doesn't like it because they feel trapped because they used to be able to play the market um, and have some flexibility there. And often what's really interesting is you'll find the the farmer's wife really gets the customer intimacy one because they understand the problems because they also have to do the cooking or thinking about what the problems are related to food. And so they we see a lot of innovation in the food space from 
the spouses who are creating these innovative channels with the customer and thinking about it. But in a New Zealand sense, it's particularly difficult um, because we don't have assets in the market. And so what you see in New Zealand, our channels are dominated by the product led with like the likes of Zespri, our Apple industry, our horticulture industry is going down that line. And then uh, Fonterra with a top end commodity type model uh, with a really amazing pricing model, which delivers um, incredible returns back to the farmer. But we've got that whole efficiency on pricing. Um, so farmers just get great prices and therefore can respond to it. They don't need to worry about what's happening on the, on the market side. Right. When I think um, looking at it from a farmer perspective, the, the two models that you talked about outside of the commodity model, dairy farmers, especially we, we just like producing, right? That's what we want to focus on. We don't want to, we're farmers because we don't want to talk to people. We're farmers because we don't want to have to do plant breeding and genetic uh, research, right? We, we want to farm. And that, I think that's really where a lot of the issue comes in is, is there's a two track path where you have the farmers that just want to put their head down and farm. And then you have the other, other people that are willing to pick their head up and say, I need to innovate. I need to figure this out. And I, I need to create more value because it's not just going to happen on the commodity side for me in my business. Yeah. So, so, so what we're seeing is, Exactly that, right? So people who go to become the and I hate the word farmer, right? I love farmers, but it's just like they're just like businessmen, right? Yeah. What, what the hell is it, right? Is it, and so what most people think of farmer is as the farm worker, right? I want to go and do the manual job. I want to go and drive the tractor. I want to go and uh, milk the cows. I want to go and plant the corn, harvest the corn go and uh, fix the machinery. That's what I love doing. Like I love being in the operational space. Um, and and often we see with farmers is that introverts, um, they're quite happy to spend the whole day by themselves, not interacting with very many other people, uh, particularly in the agricultural sense. In the horticulture space, you've got to manage people, right? So you get a different type of person in horticulture than what you get in arable um, or cropping agriculture or dairy or sheep, beef, livestock stuff. And those ones, people spend a lot of hours by themselves and not having to interact with everyone, and they're quite comfortable doing that. They don't want to interact with it. So in the traditional sense, the commodity market has been really good to them. Right. And, and they've been able to go and buy this piece of land and work it, and sometimes they work a second job if they can't make enough money out of it. But, but they create wealth and capture wealth in the land mm -hmm. and they create enough cash flow to be able to pay the bank manager off. And when they retire, um, there's enough wealth left there that they can retire and buy a house and, and live comfortably ever after and just work hard and that's okay, right? And I don't need to interact with other people and carry on. However, what's happened is we've seen this transformation occur where we've got innovative people coming back to be farmers who come back to be farmers but farm business managers and think about how can I do this differently, right? I can hire those farmers as farm workers and farm managers to manage my farm as doing production stuff on the cost side, right? Just like mm -hmm. factory workers and I'll become the farm farmer, I'll become the business manager and I'll start managing that business and driving this business in a in a different way in a different sense, right? And um, and you see this happening, right? This is a new group of people, and it's happening since you were at Michigan State. Is there's this new breed of farmers who are coming through, who are business people, right? They are marketers. They they understand what their market is. They want to think about what's that new business model, and we can employ the traditional farmer as the production worker, operator, for minimum wage, right? So we can go out and find those people. I can ma And I've got the skill sets to manage lots of people. Lots of them don't. And so I can actually manage them. I can make their life easier. But suddenly working on a farm is becoming a um, – it's like just a basic trade, right? And so 
these good managers, business managers are spending their life in an office and in the market managing and thinking how to do things differently and creating substantial economic excess wealth and excess returns off that land, which is therefore causing pressure, right? Because the farmers who are in the traditional sense are looking next door and going, why can't I do that? But that's actually really complex. It's a really difficult thing to do and they don't have those skill sets. Yeah. And so they then have to make a choice, right? Do I go and get those skill sets or can I get those skill sets or do I join an organization which has those skill sets and provide them to me? And we've got this real conflict going on at the moment. It was okay when everyone was in that commodity world, but now other people in either a product leadership one or a customer intimacy world, um, and you're starting to see these innovations, you're sitting going like, how's this young guy coming in and doing things differently? Um, and where do we need to go? Why do we need to go there? Um, and that's creating conflict. Um, but it's creating a lot of disparity, right? Like you're saying, you, you have you have this guy that's been doing it the same way for 40 years, his whole career, and barely making it. And then you have somebody coming in and creating huge amounts of wealth in five years that was yep. 20 years younger than him. And I was talking to some um, grain farmers in Canterbury, uh, crop farmers, and they said, they said dairy farms turned up to, in Canterbury and they've got massive cash flow, right? And yep. suddenly they're going on holiday, international holidays with their family every year. They're sending their kids to private schools. They turn out and driving a um, Range Rover or an Audi uh, Q9 four wheel drive, um, and they're looking there at my uh, Ford Ranger, pick, my pickup truck, and um, and they're going, "What's going on here?" Right. So they're now sitting there going, "Life was pretty good until suddenly this other one came in and does things differently," and suddenly you're looking and saying they're creating this huge excess cash flow by doing it differently. And they're going, actually, I want to be part of that, right? So they're now asking, how do we think about doing this? But it's not, where's the channel? How do we build the channel? And the innovative ones are trying to work this out and create it differently. But then there's this question about how do you share the rents, right? How do you, how do people co-invest into it? Because it's not a right that you have the right to do this. You either co-invest and do that to lift into it or you the rents go to the entrepreneur mm -hmm. who created this new channel um and so there's this real conflict i see as this changes and people start rethinking how they use that land and they become managers of the land and bringing new innovation to it is do does everyone come together and co-invest in a cooperative or do we try to think about how to do it individually and now there's this conflict right between the entrepreneur who's trying to capture all the rents and do we need to create a cooperative to do this? But the young generation out there don't actually understand the role of cooperatives and they don't actually understand why you need to have a cooperative and actually it's worthwhile investing in this and they don't understand that you need to invest in the market. Their forefathers did it because they recognised the risk of in the markets and so they did it 100 years ago or 50 years ago but now we're often on farms where we've got two generations away from from the generation that built the cooperative. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's three generations, right? So the great-grandfather's already died, right? And the grandfather knows about it, but you don't really listen to him. And dad doesn't sort of knows about it, but you don't listen to dad. Um, and so suddenly you go, well, why do we do this, right? Because they assume the market's always going to give them this return, but now they're getting marginalized. There's all these costs coming on them and they don't have power. They don't know what to go and do, but they haven't been taught the basic sensibilities of, of analyzing markets because they went through and got a degree in animal science or crop sciences and they've just gone and become a, a, a farmer technician um, and they just don't have that high-end level of business skills. And we're seeing what's interesting in New Zealand is we're actually seeing this really interesting switch and I was – giving a talk to a farmer group last week and said we're seeing the development of the um, female CEO on farm. Mm -hmm. And so the wife, they used, to have the, they used to have the farmer and the farmer's wife, right? And so the farmer managed the farm, ran the farm, did all the production, looked after all the books, and the wife was at home looking after the kids and cooking meals and keeping all the farmer's happy and everything else. What we're now seeing is this change, right? As farmers have started 
as introverts, they just did what they did on their farm, sold in commodity market. You're now seeing farmers' wives who are coming with professional skills. They've got corporate experience. They've been working in large multinationals in the agricultural sector. They end up marrying a, into a farming uh, family, and they end up bringing all of that corporate process and corporate understanding to the farm. And effectively, as the market's changing, you've got to have all these new regulations around climate and greenhouse gases and water and whatever else, food safety, etc. The wife stepping into a management role and then very quickly taking on the strategic role as you move from being a commodity player to sitting there and saying, actual fact, we can go and play in a product leadership world or we can play in a in a commodity in a um, customer intimacy and a, and a customer led world, they have those sensibilities. They are starting to lead and become the CEO of the farm while the farmer becomes the operating manager. So both partners are having a, a big portion of, of the enterprise, one under the business side, one under the, the operations. Yeah, yeah, and so you start seeing this change occur because the one who is the farmer spent their whole life on the farm farming, mm -hmm. and they've got the technical skills, but they don't have these market sensibilities. They don't actually understand what the value chains are. They don't understand the processes and the risk related to it because they're looking at the world how it used to be, and that's what they've been done their apprenticeship in. Mm -hmm. And so you're now actually looking to find people who have got these new skill sets, and we're seeing this across New Zealand, where you and then what's What's really wicked is when you get a husband and wife who have both got that corporate experience and then come back and farm and then they power this up at a at a totally different level. And then they're employing lots of traditional farmers as their as their workers in their farm team. Um, and they're creating they're moving from sort of this farm with a farmer's jack of all trades who can do everything to these high performance teams. And then thinking about where the where the leaders of this high performance team, and and what are those different roles that we need to play to the strengths of the two of the husband and wife, and then of everyone else into it, yep. and then working out how do you create, uh, once they start thinking about a high performance team, who are the team members, what do they need to have, how do we actually keep them part of this business, and so now the farm moves from being, this is my capture of of equity and life in this land. Um, to now I've actually got to create this business on top of the land and I've got to provide equity opportunities for all of, all of my employees in that business. And that's a total mindset change. That's, that's very different from what their parents and grandparents did to now where they're having to go to uh, create corporate businesses uh, with a whole corporate and spend. I, every time I go and visit a farm, good farmers, and I've got students there, I ask them, how much of your week do you spend in the office? And how much do you spend going out? And I took a group of students out to our, um, a sheep, beef, and deer farm uh, last week. And the, the Dan, who's the owner, looked at me and said, oh, not a, I don't spend enough time on the farm doing the jobs. Every now and then I break out. I spend my life on a telephone and in the office in front of a computer um, and driving around, checking on things, and in town doing deals. But I'm, I've got managers who go and manage all of my operations, and I've got teams underneath them. And my job is to manage those teams. Yeah. And so I don't do anything. Every now and then, I force myself into go and drenching cattle or sheep, um, and do the odd muster. But I'm not out there every day. I'm probably in the office three days a week maybe on farm one day a week and I'm in town at meetings for the other day a week. And that's the transformation that's happening as people move to these other two forms. If you stay commodity, that's fine. But yeah, um, yeah, it, it's a different world. It is. And, and to that person that you were just talking about, um, your friend of yours that, that you're taking the field trip to, and in your position, Connection is really important, right? Because if they don't have the connections to make the deals or to find the markets or to find the people, the technicians that are going to be doing the, the actual farm work, 
um, it's not going to happen. So you want to go into a little bit. I know that's been a real big thing for you through your whole career is connection and the importance of that. Yeah, so it's, it's really, really important, right? Because what you have is most farmers have over the last three or four decades have created wealth through specialization mm -hmm. and becoming really, really efficient producers and increasing productivity and have lots of connections to people who help them be really, really productive, right? And produce whatever they're, they're producing more efficiently and effectively, adopting the latest on-farm technology, finding out where it is. And their connection is all about efficiency and getting more and more efficient at what I do as it's currently structured. We're now asking them to make this change and go into and think differently and they go, well, where do I start? Who do I talk to? None of their connections and their networks align to where they need to go. They don't have the relationships. They don't have the connections. They don't have the, um, the understanding about actually what's it look like. What's a value chain look like? What does the market really want? So I've spent oh, 30 years walking students and executives and farmers along value chains into global markets and helping them understand what that market looks like and helping them realize that, yes, you've got to go to the market and understand that. And then how do you give them the basic sensibilities? And then how do you help them create those right connections? And where do you go to look to find them and make sense of it? Because it's a total new skill set mm -hmm. that they don't have. And um, you have to retrain the brain. You've got to go through and rethink about this, refocus it. it, it it's, it absolutely screws with your head as you think about it um, and you have to change them. And, and the really interesting one is it's difficult to see that when you're sitting in your own country and you're looking at the system as it currently is because you take all of these systems as given and fixed. And so therefore it's really hard to see it. And so one of the things we've learned is you've got to pick people up and take them to a different country and look at that system in that different country to understand how the system and all the different parts of the value chain work and operate to then get you to look back at your own way it does it and go, oh, we should be doing this differently. If we change this part of the channel or, this, or the value chain, that would change the way that we did things on farm. Actual fact, we've been fighting it here on farm, but if we actually change this piece or this piece of the value chain, it would make it really, really easy, but we just haven't had that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so now you've got to think about a value chain as a whole system and how you can manipulate that system to work better for everyone. But often you can't do that until you've gone overseas and, and pulled apart someone else's value chain. It's like when you went to New Zealand and looked at dairy in New Zealand as an undergraduate, you suddenly got this totally different perspective on dairy and went, oh, this is what they were talking about. This is why they do it this way. This is how it operates I've actually got to think about this thing differently. Now you come back to America and it gives you a better understanding of the US system because you can see what's different. You can compare and contrast and go, why are we doing this piece different than this one? Right. Why is this one different, right? Why is this one the same? And and what's the implications of those? That, that explains exactly what happened with my business model. I looked at what New Zealand was doing. I looked at, uh, I, I focused when I came home from that on asset turnover, because typically in the U.S., asset turnover in, on dairy farms is really low. In New Zealand, it was quite a bit higher, and and they're using those assets so efficiently. And that's really what I focused on when I developed my farm. That that's what allowed me to grow. And I would have never seen that. I would have never even probably started my farm because I wouldn't have seen how it could be achieved to be successful without that. It, it, and you go back to that, like you look at New Zealand, land's expensive and interest rates are really expensive, right? So you have to invest in the land because you can't farm without it, right? Right. So your only other way is to make sure that you minimize your capital assets on the farm and use those assets really, really efficiently. Yep. And it doesn't, you don't need to have the newest milking shed. You don't need to have that. Some people do because they've got lots of wealth, Right. But what you've got to do is work out how do I create the right combination which gives me the greatest cash returns to be able to pay down my debt um, and drive that. And so everyone will create a different model. But, man, asset turnover, as you say, right, that efficiency that you use your capital 
um, is really, really critical in the New Zealand system yep. to really drive it and think about different models. And people have different models in the way they do that. They have it in the cropping industry as well in the US because you often outsource for your contractors come in to do the all of your harvesting, et cetera, Mm-hmm. And then people make decisions. Do I like fixing machinery? So I might have older machinery, but I fix it, but it's really cheap and inexpensive. Other people lease it because that's too difficult and I'll just work it really, really hard every season and use the latest ones because I don't have to deal with breakdowns because I don't want to fix them. And so those models are really, really important, but we haven't thought about actually what's the business model on the farm and the innovation of the business model is really, really important. We think about innovation at a technology standpoint and what technology can we bring in, right? But in actual fact, the biggest thing where you make money is actually your business model innovation, which you've done with your farm and the way that you've thought about it differentiates you from the other farmers Mm -hmm. and and creates a success because you've thought about the business model that I'm operating, not just the production model, but actually the business model that and the technology, but the business model that's underlying uh, your farm. Yeah, and that's where I started from before I even milked a cow. Yep. And then you sit there and you go, okay, how? And then suddenly it becomes viable, right? So then you sit there and say, well, how can I get cows? How can I decrease my capital cost, right? So I can lease land. Can I cash flow that? Yes, I can. How do I get inexpensive buildings and assets to be able to run that and then deliver the cash flow that I need to be able to grow my business? that I can then bank it and then I can start buying other assets to go into it and grow my business. But that's a mindset change. Yeah. And and the way that you think about it. Completely. Yeah. Well, we're running a little bit uh, short on time here. So I just uh, want to be respectful of, of your time. Um, I, the last question I wanted to go into just for a couple minutes here, what's been the greatest achievement in your career so far? You've done a lot of things. People. People, 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 people. Um, it's been the ability to be able to, just like yourself, right, is be able to identify um, individuals and really sort of challenge them to think differently and challenge them to think about actually how they can uh, and empower them to have a different mindset um, and then activate them to become change agents um, in the agricultural sector and actually power up those farmers Um you can't work with all of them, but you can. Once you get a few of them, you network them together, and you suddenly create a movement. And that movement of these individuals, you can watch them develop. Um, and you go and sit there, and you watch how my current students bump into you, both older ones and younger ones bump into you at the um, International Dairy Forum in Chicago. And I get the photos coming back. <laughs> Look who I found. Uh, on and and that's that's the power of change, right? Change happens because of people, um, and how you help them have a mindset and think that things are possible, and everyone can make change. And so it's just this mindset that you help them with a different mindset, help them with the understanding the different models, help them understand where they should be focusing their energy, um, and then bring other people along. Like agriculture is a people business; we forget about it. We sit on farms and we do everything by ourselves. But uh, if we're going to live and operate in this global world, we've got to lean together as a group of farmers, and that's people and connections um, and collectively doing things for the better. Yeah, that's that's great insight. And I really appreciate this talk on the value chains uh, in agriculture. It's something that I don't usually hear on other podcasts, uh, but it's very important, very great perspective. So I really appreciate you spending some time today to talk to us about it. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. I'm I'm passionate about value chains. I've been passionate about it for 30 years, ever since I was in the US. And that first um, introduction to John Atkins walking up the driveway my second day in North America uh, changed my life and my career. Well, I know you've done that for a lot of other people. So um, where can people find out more about you if they want to get in touch with you? What What's the best way to do that? Uh, you've LinkedIn, hit me up on LinkedIn. No problem. Um, Lincoln, um, the Lincoln website, um, but LinkedIn's just as easy as anything else. There's only three Hamish cows in the world. And so you'll work out. (laughs) So it's not that hard. (laughs) The value chain guy, right? (laughs) Yeah. Well, Hamish, thank you so much for being on the Ag Culture podcast today. We really appreciate it. 
My pleasure, Paul. Have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to the Ag Culture Podcast today. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful conversation with Hamish Gao. I found it very fascinating, and I really enjoyed catching up with Hamish once again. If you'd like to reach out to Hamish, uh, go to our show notes and find a link to his LinkedIn profile there, or just look him up on LinkedIn. And speaking of social media, follow us along on all the major platforms at Ag Culture Podcast and visit us at our website at www.agculturepodcast.com. We'd really appreciate any ratings or reviews that you're willing to give us. And as always, please share this with anyone that you think would find value from it. And until next week, I'm Paul Windemuller, and this has been the Ag Culture Podcast.